afternoon. Uh, I'm Victoria Preston. I am moderating the panel for these four great experts we have here. And I'd like to begin by introducing them. Uh, we have Miriam Lexman, who is the director of the EU office of the International Republican Institute. Miriam brings a unique perspective on the process of democratic evolution to her work both as a diplomat and as an active member of civil society movements and projects. During the, post, the years of post-communist transition, Miriam was actively involved in various Central and Eastern European civil society movements and projects, and following Slovakia's accession to the EU, served as the permanent representative of the Slovak parliament to the EU. Following her diplomatic career, Miriam joined the International Republican Institute as director of EU regional programs, and since 2015, she has run the IRI Beacon Project, which aims to strengthen transatlantic dialogue in defense of the core values of liberal democracy against threats from outside and within. Ms. Lexman is a member of the board of the Anton Tunega Foundation and regularly publishes articles on topics relating to democracy, the roles of civil society and political parties, and Central and Eastern Europe. We also have uh, Julian Ropka here, who is the political editor of Build. Uh, Julian operated as a journalist in the both the informal and formal media and has a very immediate understanding of Marshall McLuhan's much quoted insight into the nature of trust in communications, the medium is the message. Prior to becoming political editor at Build, Julian worked as an anonymous citizen journalist, analyzing asymmetrical conflicts with a focus on the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. He has followed the crises in Syria and Ukraine since their beginnings, using open source intelligent methods for in-depth analysis. Julian was one of the first journalists to identify the full extent of Russian involvement in southern and eastern Ukraine. And while he remained anonymous for safety reasons, his reports were quoted by multiple media organizations in Germany and the UK. Two years ago, he became political editor for Bild, Germany's largest newspaper and online news portal where he continues to analyze Russian hybrid warfare, debunking disinformation and influence campaigns in Germany, Europe, and the US. He is now a target of hostile propaganda himself, uh, which, Julian, is a resounding endorsement of the impact of your work. He's also been a regular columnist for the largest Syrian opposition news network, OrientNet, and remains focused on armed conflicts, especially in Syria and Ukraine, specializing in using open source methods. Born in former East Berlin, before the wall came down, Julian is truly a product of European democratic development since the end of the Cold War, and as such brings a very particular perspective to our topic. We have Jed Willard, who, uh, thank you for flying in, from uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Jed is the director of global engagement at the FDR Foundation at Harvard College. Jed's work at the Franklin D. Roosevelt Foundation honors the 32nd American president's legacy by pursuing solutions to current global challenges while keeping in mind their historic origins. FDR's most quoted phrase, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, goes right to the heart of any propaganda or information warfare campaign and how we respond to it. Over the past decade, Jed has worked with dozens of governments and other international actors, helping them to understand prevalent and emerging narratives, the drivers of public opinion and sentiment, and creating strategies and structures to effectively engage citizens around the globe. His current efforts focus on adaptation to climate change, coping with disinformation, and revitalizing faith in the Enlightenment tradition. He's also doing some work on the Arctic and uh, the Transatlantic Alliance and the linkages between cultural and economic diplomacy. And we're going to hear more of the kind of cultural aspect of uh, our topic today in this panel. He founded the Public Diplomacy Collaborative at Harvard's Kennedy School, applying social sciences to international communication challenges, as well as Language Corp, 
where he launched 16 work abroad programs on four continents. And we also have from the States, via Switzerland, uh, Matthew Armstrong, an author and advisor on public diplomacy, international information, and propaganda. Matt is an associate fellow at King's Center for Strategic Communication at King's College in London, and is a communication professional with special expertise in the area of public diplomacy and the role of public opinion in foreign affairs. His focus is on shaping operating structures, authorities, doctrine, and individual opinions to positively impact informational activities by civilian and military government agencies in support of national or organizational strategy. He served as a governor on the US Broadcasting Board of Governors, where he provided strategic guidance and oversight over the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Asia, Office of Cuba Broadcasting, and the Middle East Broadcasting Network. Collectively and separate from the organization's expansive internet freedom programs, these networks operated in up to 61 languages in over 100 countries. And this is what Matt means when he includes the prefix international to describe the scope of his work. He has lectured widely on public diplomacy, including at the USC Annenberg School of Communication and Journalism, and is often called to speak at US military schools, NATO, and other foreign government institutions. As a testament to the value of Matt's contribution, in 2016, he was made an honorary member of the Psychological Operations Regiment at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, this is home to the largest military installation in the world with a population of over 50,000, of whom more than 65% are under 24 years of age. And this brings, brings us on to one of Matt's themes we'll, he will talk about today, which is who owns tomorrow. Starting uh, with uh, Miriam, uh, can I uh, ask you to uh, come to the podium? The Mir Miriam is uh, going to talk about Russian influence activities and how they might develop over the next 10 years, but within a wider historical uh, perspective and looking uh, uh, at the relationship between Russia and Europe before asking what should we be doing to support the social and political development aspirations of our European neighbors. Miriam. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the, uh, for the invitation to this uh, panel and to this discussion. I see many distinguished guests in the, in the audience and I am looking forward to the, to the discussion, so I'm honored and privileged to be able to discuss with you. And to be honest, when I was thinking and preparing for, for this panel, I actually, I must admit that I like the title of our panel, which is Question More, because sometimes I was, I was coming to more questions than answers when I was preparing. So this is very helpful that I can actually pose questions rather than, than giving you answers. And also I thought like maybe I should talk about the Russian soft power and how it was revealed in the latest years where we actually realize how it's being used against our democracy and, and the West. But then I realized that practically you are more than experts than I in, in this era. Most of the rebalance has happened actually on the NATO different discussions and platforms where the Russians in different ways hinted what their intentions were. So I thought that maybe what could contribute to this debate is, um, is a story uh, of me as a person who was born on the other side of the Iron Curtain, or actually on this side of the Iron Curtain because we are in Riga, on the, on, in a post or that, that time communist Czechoslovakia, in a family of a, of a dissident. And I remember as a child where my parents were telling me that the most evil part of the Soviet system is that it attacks the core essence of human person. It attacks the liberty and dignity of a human person. And for this liberty and dignity, my predecessors have given up their freedom or have given up their, their, even, their life. And that's why I would like to focus on this part of aspect of the current propaganda and disinformation, how this is eroding actually our freedom and dignity. During the communist system, it was mainly by physical suppression, but 
lately the kind of moral erosion and relativism is mainly being used by the different disinformative narratives and propaganda being used by current Russia. And the, the current technologies actually allow that these narratives, these uh, false narratives and images are entering into every household in our society or even every pocket of every person who holds a, a, a mobile phone with, with possibilities to be connected to internet. The, the main aim was, or can be described as dividend impera. That was the kind of main aim of the propaganda during the Cold War, but it's practically the same, same aim is, is today, and the moral erosion as a part of it. In current Russia, talking about the moral erosion, we can talk about the way how the human dignity is being suppressed by the image the state-owned or state-run media are giving about about human person, where the image of a woman is shrink into her beauty and the, the, the value of a, of a man is shrink to his wallet. And similar moral erosion is being distributed through the different means of propaganda in the West and is tapping into the maybe deep divisions among society in terms of ideology and, and the kind of internal uh, tensions in, in our democracy. And the post-true era or the, or the era of current relativism, which is boosted by, by disinformation and false narratives, is creating a huge space for propaganda to be exploited by, by the Russian propaganda or any other, any other uh, internal, external um, enemies. Of, of free democracy or free society. And maybe I will talk about the uh, internal inherent tensions of democracy, which I believe are a kind of Achilles heel at the moment. And the internal tensions are around the kind of divisions which are very natural in our society. It's the, it's the tension between liberty versus security or individualism versus collectivism or individual responsibility versus collective responsibility. And I would even say maybe kind of the, the distinction between the tension between the kind of French approach to human rights and the Anglo-American approach to human rights where we see it as a maybe the first one is the, when human rights are more guaranteed and the resource of human rights is the state versus maybe more religious understanding of human rights where God is the guarantor of human rights. And in terms of crisis, the, these inherent tensions of democracies are being shaken and, and we see that the balance is, or the, the balance is being addressed and is being challenged and can be challenged and is being challenged by disinformation. And maybe now talking about Europe, I mean, Europe has gone through a couple of crises in the last decade. It was the financial crisis, then the economic crisis. Today we have the, or we had the, the immigration crisis. We, we are facing a crisis of identity. And all these crises are actually putting these tensions in, uh, in a imbalance. And that's precisely what is being used by, and, and it's not only Russia, it's different internal and external actors who are trying to uh, uh, attack our core liberal values and use it in their advantage. And these tensions are leading into deep divisions among our communities. Maybe one gap which is being exploited by the Russian propaganda today, where I see is maybe one of the kind of main uh, path the propaganda is or, or lines the propaganda is going al uh, along to is the liberal conservative divide in our society. And I also see that this is not being addressed by our own societies and that's why I would like to mention this Achilles heel of our liberal democracy and I believe that healing of this, of this gap would be one of the ways how to limit the, the, the negative impacts of, of the Russian propaganda and, and disinformation for the sake. Because 
this, this was happening during the Cold War era and it's happening now, that the, that the, the main weapon we have in our hands is actually to heal our societies and to make them more adherent to our values we talk about. I think we spend too much time sometimes discussing what the Russians are doing and, and too few time to look what we can do in order to heal our societies and close the gaps which are being exploited by, by different uh, foes of, our, of, of liberal democracy. And where I see this one of the kind of gaps is when we talk about common values, because there is less and less common understanding what we actually mean by the common values. And I think we need to come back, try to answer these questions and bring the two parts of a society which are being divided by the way how they understand these values together in a discussion and debate. When we talk about common values, we talk about liberty, but there is a lack of understanding what actually limits the liberty and what supports our liberty. We talk about dignity, but there is lack of understanding what undermines dignity and what respects dignity. We talk about life, but we cannot agree where life actually starts and how it can or should be ended. And all these tensions in our democracy, which are natural to every democratic system, are being exploited by, by the kind of negative impact of the, of the human nature of discovery, which is internet. That we see that internet has a negative impact because the bubbles the internet is creating and, and, the, and, the, and the way how these issues are being discussed is creating further gaps rather than bringing people together in, in a debate. And all this is happening, I would even say, in a kind of moral vacuum which we currently face. And of course we can d discuss many different ways and when it, many different aspects or examples why we can talk about also certain moral vacuum in our society today. But vis-a-vis -vis Russia, I see a couple of moral vacuums which actually lead to further confusion and, and kind of the, the boost the relativism which is already being in the society. I mean, we talk about trying or our attempts to help to support democracy in Russia, and we thought originally, and maybe in a na naive way, that our economic engagement in Russia will help, will lead to, to economic prosperity, and economic prosperity will lead to democracy and will support democracy. Already a long time ago, we have realized that this doesn't work, that practically it works the other way around, that, the, that Russian oligarchs are corrupting our economic system and we are unable to bring democracy in Russia. But there is no reaction to that. We, we talk about human rights and our, uh, our attempt to uphold human rights, but at the Human Rights Court in Strasbourg, we have Russian judges who are deciding about the cases of European citizens when they sue their governments for violation of their rights. We have Russian judges de deciding about these cases. We talk about energy being used as a weapon, new weapon of the new cold, cold war, but at the same time, we are still, we are not ready to close the pipelines coming from Russia to Europe and, and stop or, or, or limit this weapon Russia is being used, uh, is using against us. And so the, the the crisis which led to, the, to these tensions in, in our democracy in a, in a combination with this moral vacuum is actually creating enormous space for disinformation propaganda coming from Russia and the Russian state. And maybe one thing to mention is that within all this, we are trying to, we are trying to bring these people to make, the, the people of the West, to make a decision if they want to belong to the West or they want, want to belong to, to, the, to the East. We want them to make a clear decision if they want to support NATO or they want to support Russia. And I believe that currently this is very difficult to pose this question because of this whole um, confusion and relativism we cause as well, our leaders and, and the way how our democracy works is causing. And that's why I think the 
one of the ways how to address the current challenge would not be to ask people to decide between, but to ask people to, to decide for something. And we need to ask people to decide to support liberal democracy, make it very clear what are the advantages of liberal democracy, and help our society to go through these tensions and to bring the, the parts of a society which are divided through different lines together in a dialogue. And why I'm thinking that this is one of the answers to, to the growing uh, disinformation is uh, the International Republican Institute has conducted an opinion poll in the Visegrad four countries, and I would like to share a couple of slides which clearly show or support my appeal to you that this is the way how I believe that we should rephrase our question. And so I have four slides on I mean, the, the, the opinion poll was a very long one, but, but there are a couple of slides which actually support this. And you see in the first fly, slide, uh, when we ask people if they believe that the NATO is providing uh, uh, security in Europe or should be resolved, you, you see that uh, except of Poland, and, and Hungary, but in Czech Republic and Slovakia, you have 50, 53% of people, percentage of people, population who, who believe that NATO should be rethought. When, when we ask if, uh, if Russia should be considered a partner for European security, you had up to 75% of Slovaks saying that they believe that Russia should be considered as a partner uh, to European security and from the lowest number is 35% of, of, uh, of population of, of Poland. When we uh, ask about the role of the United States, you see even these countries which, who considered the United States as a, as a co-partner for, for decades, you see that, that practically except of Poland, or yes, you have 60% of uh, population of Slovakia, 44% in Czech Republic, 27% in, in Poland and 41% in Hungary believe that the role of the United States is actually more controversial and, and, and the United States should be excluded for, for the European security structures. And this is the final, final picture where when people are asked to, uh, to decide between standing or supporting NATO or rather having a neutral position of the country, you see that in all four countries, more than half of the population, when, when, you, when you come together, strongly agree and somehow, somewhat agree, more than half of the population in all of the four countries actually supports neutrality. And this leads me to, to think that the question has to be rephrased, that we should not ask where do we, do we belong or we want to belong, but we need to ask the people where do they want to go, for what, we would like, they would like to decide, and we have to help them to understand the advantages of the free society and liberal democracy. Thank you very much. To ask her. Miriam, I just wanted to ask you one question uh, um, be uh, before mo moving on to Julian, which is uh, Ambassador Ildim said this morning that uh, it's difficult sometimes to get a consensus within NATO, and that that was a strength. Do you think uh, that we, do you think Western liberalism needs to be less dogmatic than we currently are in seeking uh, affinity rather than uh, a, a sort of broader uh, consensus within uh, groups of allies about what the future might look like for each of those parties? Yeah, I, I think the kind of strongest or biggest problem is that we can call it being less dogmatic or I would, I would maybe call it that we need to be more open what people say and how they feel about certain issues and we have to be also more um, aware of the fact that when we talk about values that we actually do not mean the same thing and this is the leaders continue talking about the leaders uh, about the values as if they all meant the same but that's actually that I think we need to be more honest and, and admit that there are certain 
there are certain gaps, and then we need to create more space for dialogue. I think this is the co core issue, and, and try to find ways how to lead the dialogue in an open way, because the, the current way, through the social media and through internet, I think this is precisely creating or deepening the gaps, because it kind of groups people in, in, the, in the bubbles of, of among those people who have the same understanding, and they do not understand how other people feel or think about the same issues. Thank you. So, um, uh, we're going to hear from Julian now, and um, Julian, if you, I know you have a, a presentation. Um, Julian's going to uh, give us a brief overview of some of the common features of Russian influence uh, with regards to Ukraine, Syria, and the enhanced forward presence of NATO in the Baltic states uh, before uh, posing the question, when we talk about uh, influence, how widely do we find this beyond cyber attacks and fake news and uh, are we naive about the extent of that thank you yes thank you uh, also for me it's a big pleasure to uh, speak here and I'm honored to be invited to this forum um, I was asked to, to uh, talk about these four areas by the organizers and of course it's totally clear that there cannot be a comprehensive picture on each of the uh, influence, uh, influence efforts in these four areas, the EFP states, Ukraine, Syria, and Germany. So I call it uh, puzzle pieces or pieces of puzzle I will, I will present to you. And of course you have to keep in mind that to, to understand the, the entire uh, picture or the, uh, understand the entire process of what's going on, you have to um, take all the different sorts of influence possibilities or influence tools together to, to get the right picture. Uh, one more remark before I start. Uh, I'm from a built newspaper, which uh, I say proud is a tabloid, and built means picture in English. And so uh, you will not see many, uh, many bullet points, but lots of pictures in the presentation. Don't be surprised by this. Um, so, so let's start. Um, when it comes to the EFP state, I think there's one uh, obvious example we all remember. It was in uh, February 2017 when uh, the Speaker of the Lithuanian Parliament and several media outlets got emails uh, alleging that German soldiers raped a Lithuanian girl. Uh, it was pretty fast debunked, the whole story, and it was uh, within, I think, three or four hours uh, um, determined that this was just simply not happening and that it was fake news. Still, if you look at how um, Russian state media, at least in Germany or about Germany, reacted to it, uh, it, it used this example of debunking uh, someone's effort um, who had a motivation of, um, of uh, demonizing the uh, German soldiers to uh, again attack the, the German press. And uh, it went even further, saying that uh, our uh, dear colleagues in Brussels from the Eurostratcom, e, uh, Eurostratcom Task Force, East, East Stratcom Task Force, whatever, sorry, um, that the whole thing was an operation by them. They ran to, um, to, to, to uh, attack Russia. So while you know what was happening there, and it's really clear that nothing happened, at least not uh, involving the uh, German soldiers and a Lithuanian girl, um, these stories are moving on since then, and this is part of, of um, this ongoing uh, attacks against German media, against this uh, Eurus Tratcom in, in, in Brussels, and against also German soldiers saying, yeah, you, you, you claim there nothing ha happened there, but we think you're hiding something. We think this was an operation you ran only against us, and there could be more following. So much for fake news. Of course, I could talk about the Lisa case, and I think you heard about this many times, but um, again, uh, this is one example of fake news on the EFP states, and this combination of influence method, fake news, and EFP states is, is uh, random here. Let's continue with cyber attacks, another tool of influence. I think we had a very uh, striking example in the end of June in, in Ukraine, where a ransomware was used um, not to get money, but to paralyze the country. Um, the the uh, tax authorities were attacked, uh, banking system was attacked, and like the supermarket in Kharkiv here was attacked. This picture was posted online uh, with a person saying, yes, we have lots of foods, but we cannot buy it. Um, because uh, you see, their, their uh, system isn't working. Um, just this morning, Mr. Avakov, the Ukrainian interior minister, said uh, that they stopped another attack. 
believe it or not, uh, and it uh, went to the same source, which is Russia again. SBU, Ukrainian intelligence, also said that Russia is behind it. There's not much evidence about it, but what I can tell you is that it's not the only, it's not an isolated attack. Just in the end of May, there was a massive, uh, the most successful ever uh, attack on the uh, communication infrastructure of the Russian, of the Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where about one week uh, the ministry couldn't couldn't communicate interiorly, domestically, and could not communicate with its dip diplomats in Europe. And for some reason, this is uh, not made public so far. I think some in the room might know why. And um, what you have to keep in mind of what you have to keep in mind, of course, is that it all happens within the context of the of the multi-layered war which is waged against Ukraine. I took this picture myself in Chirokine last September. So just you know, this are, these are pieces of the puzzles and you have to see them in the, bright, in the wider context. To the next example, and these two examples now, Syria and Germany, are will have a little bigger. Uh, the war against ISIS, Russia's war against ISIS. And I argue it, there has never been a Russian war against ISIS. There is a war against the West and Russia wages this, for example, in Syria. So let's see what Russia claims in Syria. They say they are fighting ISIS and terrorism. Like later on, some months after they started, they realized there was also another terror organization, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, uh, which now has another name, but is still close to Al-Qaeda. What we are, were hearing from Russia since, 2000, since September 30, 2015, they started there, was a bunch of lies about what's happening there. I will just give you one example. There was a big press conference in the end of um, 2015, I, I really like this example because the Russian Ministry of uh, Defense was, was talking to around 30 journalists and these pictures were shared worldwide. Uh, they said they were attacking ISIS oil facilities um, in, in Syria. Um, we analyzed their footage. You, can, you just have a still here, but all of them were destroyed. Everything you see on the picture was destroyed by Russian bombs. And uh, we analyzed the footage and not only found out that only one of the facilities was in ISIS held areas, but also that what we see and what was destroyed, we found them on the map, as you can see, and we showed the pictures to experts. The first one, it's called an oil, oil storage facility. It's grain silos. So grain silos for the harvest for the, of the people of Syria. And the second one on the lower left side, an oil production plant. This is a water treatment plant, which was totally destroyed by Russia. Um, these are just, this is just one example um, of them telling the world into their faces. Uh, we are attacking ISIS, we are destroying their oil infrastructure. They were not striking ISIS, they were not striking oil infrastructures. This is just a very obvious example. Benninkert and many others analyzed uh, more than 60 videos from until early 2016 showing that um, Russia didn't even attack ISIS held areas. Right now, there are Russian airstrikes against ISIS. The question is why? I can tell you it's not because of ISIS. Iran and Russia are going against ISIS right now because the United States uh, uh, made gains against ISIS in the southeast and in the north of Syria. And to stop these advances, uh, advances which then would uh, forbid Mr. Assad and his allies, his backers, uh, to recapture the area, that's, that's why they started the offensives. And you could see it wherever they start them, they collide with the, uh, or they, they get in clashes, and sometimes serious clashes uh, with, the, with the United States and their allies. What did Russia really do in Syria? So. Well, I, I won't spare this picture. What Russia did during the whole time was attacking civilians, uh, civilian areas. And I spoke to an, an Israeli intelligence official and he said, ah, that's a strategy, uh, an old strategy. If you kill them all, you also probably kill your enemies. Um, but there are more, there's more about it. That's not just a war against everyone. So you, in the end, for example, capture Aleppo but it's a war, a systematic war against civilian infrastructure, and there are lots of reports about this, uh, which, which were proven. Um, and this is just one example. In 2016, you can see the blue mark, uh, Russia killed almost, according to the Syrian Network for Human Rights, 4,000 Syrian civilians. So why are they doing this? And what are they believing to achieve? As I said, I firmly believe that this is an attack on the West, and I'm not saying on NATO or on Europe or on the US, but uh, there are different aspects on that. First, Russia achieved that the rift within NATO even deepened. There is uh, Turkey, which is now trying everything to uh, not be under Russian uh, sanctions and under Russian military pressure. 
And it's an interesting story how it went. You, you remember that when Russia went into Syria, uh, Turkey was begging NATO and other allies to help them countering this threat. And they were calling them the worst thing ever happened and they shoot down one uh, plane, which was three seconds over to Turkey, as far as I know. Um, still afterwards, Russia reacted in such a strong way that it uh, forced Turkey into reconciliation with Russia. And right now, they are not yet threatening to leave NATO, but they are getting more and more between NATO and Russia and other regional powers. A second thing why I think this is an active influence of thought of Russia against the West is that their bombs caused refugees and their bombs deliberately caused refugees. By destroying schools, hospitals, water facilities, they wanted people to flee the area. Between the start of the Russian intervention and now, there's 1.1 million refugees more in Turkey. And you might say, great, we have this deal with Turkey, so they're not coming to us, to Europe. But for example, Germany pays 428 million euros to Turkey to keep the refugees inside their country and have a better uh, treatment of them within the country. At the same time, you see that uh, these refugees, these streams of people, streams of humans, which also made it to Europe, many of them, to Germany, around one million, um, they do enormous good for what the Kremlin wants in Europe, to strengthen radical parties and to strengthen populists, which are not only anti-refugee, but in many cases also pro-Russian. And of course, Mr. Putin just said some days ago why they went to Syria. I, I will just read it. Putin also said that Russia had gained priceless experience by using its newest weapons during the Syria operation as advanced weapons had been put to test, and so on and so forth. So Russia itself gave a reason why they went to Syria. It was not about Syria, it was not about ISIS, it was to, to test weapons. So what about ISIS in the end? Here's one tweet by the Russian Foreign Ministry which I really think is, is remarkable. Uh, Mrs. Sakharova, Mrs. Sakharova said, we note with satisfaction the increase in positive trends in the military political situation in Syria, US bombing victim. So this is pure sarcasm. Uh, this is a report about 43 civilians being killed in Raqqa during the real operation against ISIS. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to say the United States is not killing civilians in Syria. They are, and they are killing, I think, 10 times more than they admit. Uh, all the pictures and all the information we get uh, prove this. Still, as soon as someone really fights against ISIS and not under the umbrella of Russia, uh, they have a big problem and Russia is not supporting their fight against ISIS. Now we come to the last country, uh, which is Germany. Whenever I get asked about, uh, whenever I'm in Europe, people ask me, yes, how is the cooperation between the extremist parties in Germany going on? The AFD on the right side and the Linke on the left side, the left party. And I'm I can tell them, yes, there's some cooperation. I mean, the linked party is 100% ideologically on the, on the Kremlin side. And they are always interviewed by Russian state media. The rightist party, they are having all their programs in Russian, which is the only party in Germany which have all their, um, all their posters and all their election program in Russian. And they have VK sites also as the only party. But still I'm saying, you're, and that's my point, you're looking at the wrong parties and you're looking at the wrong instruments. What I think is a very important and one of the most important instruments of Russian influence is, for example, this one here, the German-Russian Forum. And here are two very important uh, actors on this. The one is uh, Matthias Platzek, the former um, chairman of the Social Democratic Party and also former governor uh, of a German um, Bundesland. And in the background, you can see the Gorshakov Foundation. So let's look at this. The Gorshakov Foundation states on its homepage uh, that it's it's, it is using soft powers to exert influence in international space by using their cultural, historic, and political values. So this organization, which is, was, funded, uh, was founded 2010 by then President Medvedev, is 100% paid by Kremlin money and is openly saying that we want to influence the West, we want to influence these countries where we are active. And we were wondering why Mr. Plotzek, wherever he is, stands in front of Goshakov uh, Foundations, why this is a registered German association, the German-Russian Forum. And we asked them, and what we got was not a media reply, but was an uh, answer by their lawyer, saying what we tell you now, you may not publish. Thank you. Uh, so it's, 
very small and it's German, so I think I'm only semi-legal here. Um, they said that whenever they go to Russia, everything uh, which is paid there is paid by the Gorshakov Foundation. So this is 50% of the activities of the German-Russian Forum, of the most important activities of their so-called Potsdamer Encounters, which are the Potsdamer Begegnung, the most important meeting. And they say, on the German side, we pay everything, so come on. <laughs> um, so what means we? We know that the budget from the German-Russian Forum on the German side is 60,000 euros when it comes to fees from their different uh, members, persons. This is not enough. They have a budget of more than, they, they need more than 200,000 euros a year to, to run what they are doing. And the, the sponsors behind this are big companies like Gazprom Germany, one of four. So you can see that more than 50% of the activities of the German-Russian Forum are directly or indirectly funded by the Kremlin. Uh, what is the result of this? On June 23, we had Mr. Mr. Lavrov here in Berlin, in Berlin, by the way, why they're saying they don't pay any money to, to, to German activities, but you can see the only sponsor in the background is the Gorshakov Foundation. Um, and at, at the same time, he was in Berlin and giving a speech, Mr. Platzek to his right, the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs was announcing that uh, Mr. Mr. Gabriel and Mr. Lavrov will both be in Krasnodar in the end of June, uh, some days ago and open a conference on city partnership, so something which really has nothing to do with foreign policy, especially not in Russia, with the Russian foreign minister opening a conference of city partnership. Um, however, Mr. Mr. Platzek was saying in the end of May, when I was coincidentally um, present at a meeting of Social Democrats, uh, he said that he personally convinced Mr. Gabriel, our now foreign minister, to go to Krasnodar, and he was very proud of it. He also later said this to Sputnik, and there's also evidence that Sputnik says he revealed that he is behind it. So here, they are both in Krasnodar, and you can see um, that the German-Russian Forum and its chairperson did their, did their best. Um, um, two more slides. Another uh, uh, tool to assert soft power, I think, are the honorary consuls of the Russian Federation. Um, you, there are four of them. Three of them are very, very close to the Social Democrats in Germany, and one of them is even a former Bundestag member, parliament member, and all of the three of them have business with Gazprom. One is directly employed, two are partly uh, employed by Gazprom. And these three people, you can see two, two of them here, Mr. Mangold, Mr. Bergmann, with our now federal president, and our former chancellor, Mr. Schröder and Mr. Steinmeier. And here's the third one. Uh, and Mr. Gabriel, our now foreign minister, is promoting a book he, he published. It's called Russia, of course. Um, so this is another tool of people. They are, they are deployed to, to areas where, frankly saying, you really don't need them. It's not in Berlin. It's not in Munich. It's not in Cologne, not in Hamburg, not anywhere where power is. It's in the rural areas. Rural, sorry, Dusseldorf. So Dusseldorf is one of them. Stuttgart is one of them. And Nuremberg is one of them. Sorry, Hannover, Hannover. So these three areas where there are not so many uh, big things going on, they're stationed, these people there, gave them Gazprom contracts and take care that they are talking to the, to the basis of the Social Democratic Party to have them demands to their ministers and say, what we really want is that you lift the sanctions from Russia. You hear this with every SPD-run Bundesland. The main the, one of their main demands is to, to, to lift sanctions on Russia. A third, I called the Chancellor Whisperer, and that's my last slide. Uh, Martin Schulz uh, warned this year several times of a new arms race with Russia. And he was talking about the 2% target of NATO. That's what he's talking about. And you can have lots of criticism about the 2% target, and you can ask yourself if it's really necessary that Germany fulfills it within a certain amount of time. But what you cannot do is calling the 2% target of the Germany and other countries an arms race with Russia. This really makes no sense at all. So I thought to myself, where did he have this from? And the first time it was called an arms race with Russia was by Mr. Peskov in December last year, when he reacted to a tweet by Mr. Trump. And he was saying, what he wants there from NATO is an arms race against us, and we will not start it. So why is Mr. Schulz, the chancellor candidate of the Social Democrats, who will maybe be the next chancellor, maybe not, why is he using this? Well, my answer would be, and because he took Mr. Schröder, now Gazprom uh, um, employee Mr. Schröder into his election team. And this is not specula uh, speculation. You can see Reuters article here um, from, from June. I would just translate. 
like Schröder, uh, Schulz condemned the US demand uh, Germany should spend 2% of its um, GDP into, into defense. So they were saying this after each other. I don't know why Mr. Schröder is now an advisor to Mr. Mr. Schulz, um, but he is. And, and we all know where, where Mr. Schröder is spending the time when he is not with uh, Mr. Schulz. And um, so, so what I, what I want to say is, I, I don't think we are naive, but I think we are looking at the wrong uh, mechanisms, and I'm thinking that we look at the wrong parties. What Russia is not that stupid. <laughs> they know, and they have different strategy for every country, as you could see. And I only showed you very small parts of the strategy. Uh, while in France, uh, they set their money and uh, other uh, propaganda tools on Le Pen. In Germany, they are not supporting the right-wing party. They are not angry uh, if they get any more voices, of course, or any more electorates. But um, what they are doing in Germany since years, and this will even improve in the future, I think, or increase in the future, is trying to assert their influence on one party. You can see which party it was. And this party is either part of the government, which uh, within important positions like um, foreign minister, foreign ministry, or if everything goes right uh, for them, then they will form a new government in September, which will be led by these people, which you just saw, and which have these uh, known attitudes towards uh, Kremlin and its activities in Europe, Syria, and elsewhere. That's for me. Thank you. So, um, Julian, I just wanted to ask you as a practical uh, matter and picking up on uh, Alex Aitken's talk this morning and also uh, the presentation by Estonia's president about the relationship between uh, government and the media, what you uh, would like to see in terms of the relationship between the press in Germany and the government in terms of getting a more trust, uh, trusted relationship? Well, <laughs> what I would like to see. I mean, um, of course, I'm uh, supporting an independent press, which should not be uh, tied too close to the, to the government. However, what my, my editor-in-chief said after, after the end of last year, where Bild ran dozens and dozens of articles trying to show what's really happening in Syria and what's really happening in Aleppo, and we were trying to convince our politicians that something is going on there and that they should act um, like having um, sanctions against uh, Russia for what they're doing in Syria. And you know there are no sanctions at all because of what Russia did in Syria. And there are also no sanctions at all because of Russia, what Russia does in eastern Ukraine, only in southern Ukraine. Um, and it was simply ignored. Um, and I have to say that we have the feeling that our then foreign minister, who is now our federal president, um, had a different understanding of what was happening in the world. You know, when he talked about Aleppo, he said, it could be to the mutual uh, cultural benefit that Russia and us rebuilt Aleppo together while Russian bombs were falling on children in Aleppo. And this was the time where we were really asking ourselves, what's, what's going on there? Why they have these absolutely out of touch and out of reality attitudes, several ministers and several politicians. And then we started searching, like, how are they lobbied? How are people, friends of them, uh, money, placed around them uh, to influence them and to give them a certain, a certain view on what's happening. And uh, the result, one of the results was what I, what I just showed you. Thank you. I'm sure we'll get plenty of questions on that. Um, uh, we're going to hear from Jed uh, next. Um, and in addressing the question um, how Western countermeasures will develop over the next few years, Jed is going to look at how we might translate our values into a defense proposition. Uh, for our society and for national security as a practical matter, how to operationalize values across all spheres, from military commanders to our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for, uh, for this question, which uh, allows me to prognosticate out a couple of years into the future. Uh, it's fun to look at the future, uh, because no one expects you to be right, and really you only have to make one decision, which is whether you want to be pessimistic or whether you want to be optimistic. And uh, I'm happy to report to uh, Yanis Sartz that I'm going to be optimistic today. Uh, I think we're going to learn some really valuable lessons, and we're going to uh, kick some serious butt. Uh, Western countermeasures 
will develop along two metrics, one macro and one micro. At the macro level, we must broaden our understanding of what's going on here and come to a general agreement about what's at stake. We are in a period of quick and dramatic societal change that's not just technological, but more importantly, socioeconomic and structural on a global scale. This is a period in which the way humans organize and govern themselves will shift, and the direction of that shift is what we are contesting. At the micro level, we need to learn how to apply the lessons from social science, campaign management, and big data to information and influence campaigns. These lessons are more immediately applicable to the problem, and perhaps therefore more exciting, but in all honesty, I do not believe they are nearly as important in the long run as the macro understanding. So, what kinds of cooperation and actions will enable Western countries and alliances to triumph at the macro level? We will need to learn to be clear about our ideology, the narratives we use to communicate and support that ideology, and our identities. I say identities, plural, uh, both because multiple identities build resilience in our populations, and because we're going to learn that there is power in considering oneself not just a good Latvian, but also a good Balt, and also a good European, and simultaneously a good transatlanticist, and lastly, a worthy child of the Enlightenment. Cultivating multiple identities will enable us to more effectively coordinate Western voices across boundaries without sacrificing authenticity. We will increasingly understand that effectively responding to foreign influence requires standing up for who we are and for what we believe. And that to do so requires a whole of government and indeed whole of, a whole of society response. Now, if this sounds challenging, it's because it is. It will require strong and honest leadership and a willingness to clarify the difference between real threats to our societies and there are real threats to our societies, from automation to climate change, they are real, versus conspiracy theories. Honestly, though, I think many of our leaders are already there. Here's a quote from Canada's Foreign Minister Freeland a month ago discussing the liberal international order. Since before the end of the Second World War, beginning with the International Conference at Bretton Woods in 1944, Canada has been deeply engaged in and greatly enjoyed the benefits of a global order based on rules. These institutions may seem commonplace now. We may take them for granted. We should not. Seventy years ago, they were revolutionary, and they set the stage for the longest period of peace and prosperity in our history. Seventy years ago, Canada played a pivotal role in forming the post-war international order. We are now called, by virtue of our unique experience, expertise, geography, diversity, and values, to do this again for a new century. And here's another quote from the same day, also in Canada, this time from President Obama. We're in an environment where we are only accepting information that fits our opinions, rather than basing our opinions on the facts that we receive and evidence, and reason, and logic. By the way, that's been part of our prosperity, the Enlightenment, and we should continue to promote those values. The liberal international order, based not just on military power or national affiliations, but on principle, on rule of law, on human rights, that's our only choice. Those of us who believe in those values and believe in democracy have to speak out with conviction. We have to listen, we have to acknowledge imperfect information, but we don't have a monopoly on wisdom. We have to speak on behalf of those things that we know are true and are right because both the facts and history are on our side. As the former president urges, the West will learn to embrace the challenge and have the argument. We will eagerly pit our system of governance against the alternatives. We will openly argue that the rule of law, independent judiciaries, electoral integrity, representative government, and freedom from corruption are good things. That liberal democracy works well, and that we like our systems, both domestically and internationally. We will learn not to debate about which Western actors are Nazis, not to repeat lies about child abductions or gay mafia plots or genocidal plans, not to waste any more energy than absolutely necessary in refuting blatant lies about non-existent bombing errors or arms deals or anti-male or anti-white agendas. Instead, we'll learn to reframe 
the questions, like any good politician, and consistently promote our own positive Western narrative. Which brings me to part two. What does this look like at the micro level? At the micro level, Western countries and alliances will learn to run information campaigns like we run political campaigns. We will tap into the rich traditions of research in neuroscience, psychology, social, social psychology, anthropology, history, economics, political science, and other sciences to help us formulate the most effective methods of promoting our own values and reframing adversarial campaigns. We are already pretty good at tracking adversarial narratives. We will next learn to reframe those narratives and replace them with our own. We will make the truth louder. Not so much with bots as with consistency of messages shared across ministries, governments, and civil society actors, the building of networks, and the identification of credible messengers and with effective audience analysis to make sure our themes are well adapted to existing preconceptions. We will learn to be proactive with those audiences, reaching out to them before they encounter disinformation. We will become better at mapping the networks of so-called experts utilized by our adversaries and better at building networks of our own, replete with messengers credible to our target audiences. We will prepare memes supporting our narrative and nullifying our adversaries' memes designed to break apart uh, unnatural alliances between far left and far right, uh, between loyal domestic opposition and foreign interventionists. Wedge memes, if you will. We will learn the importance of repetition, repetition, and repetition when it comes to telling our own stories and of not repeating adversarial or false narratives. We will make the truth louder. We will not be trapped by our adversaries' framing of persons or of events. Here I'm going to quote McLean's Terry Glavin describing how the Canadian media handled accusations that their new foreign minister was from a family of Nazis. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we've all spent a great deal of effort being clever in our elucidations about how to properly distinguish between a Ukrainian patriot and a Nazi collaborator in the terror time of the 1940s and about where one might situate the boundaries of Soviet-occupied Eastern Galicia on contemporary maps of the Polish-Ukrainian borderlands and other such boring ephemera. This is what Moscow wanted, and it also wanted the not especially bright among us to be wondering out loud and often about whether it might be true that Freeland is a Russophobic Nazi sympathizer who can't be trusted with the foreign affairs portfolio. Don't get trapped in their frame discredit it instead. In short, we will realize that this is an ideological conflict, a contest of narratives with strategic outcomes. We're going to learn to take the fight uh, to the level of meta-narrative, and there we'll have the argument about which systems of governance are best for the governed, and we'll win the argument, because for all our challenges, and the challenges are real, liberal democracy, the post-war intellectual international order and democratic governance are responsive and effective, especially when you compare them with corrupt, dysfunctional, kleptocratic, patriarchal autocracies. Finally, to the question of information activities having a higher profile in Western defense policies and doctrines. Uh, they may not become as predominant in United States defense policy, so long as we have by far the largest military and therefore a tendency to uh, view problems and solutions through a steel lens. Uh, then again, that could change if the military successfully pivots toward strategic doctrine that emphasizes the non-kinetic phases of combat, a process that I'm told is underway, uh, but I've been told it's underway for about 10 years now. Um, I'd be interested in hearing from Americans in this room as to progress around doctrine, coping with human terrain, uh, target audience analysis, phase zero, et cetera. Uh, there's also the chance the United States could begin to reemphasize information activities in civilian agencies along the lines of our investments during World War II and the Cold War. Uh, I really don't see that happening in the next two years, quite the opposite, in fact. Uh, but outside of my country, I believe we're seeing a dramatic increase in the understanding of information activities, especially in Northern Europe, uh, from here in the Baltic straight over to Britain. Uh, this is not surprising since, one, uh, other democracies lack the burden of possessing history's largest kinetic force, and two, they invented this stuff. Uh, some of the most compelling examples of information activities date back to World War II and the interwar period, uh, where France and Britain, Germany, Italy, and the Soviet Union pioneered the use of modern technology to fight non-kinetic battles worldwide. 
When you look at the current speed of technological change today, and the corresponding empowerment of individuals and non-traditional groupings of individuals, I see tremendous parallels with the interwar period. I also see uh, greater clarity back then around the nature of the conflict. The people and organizations working to promote fascism, communism, and liberal democracy were consciously battling to define human destiny, and all sides were convinced they were right. And this gets me back to my main point. Western democracies will be well-placed to cope with disinformation campaigns when we are confident enough to reframe them. I'm confident enough in the post-war international order broadly, the European experiment specifically, and the Enlightenment tradition ideologically to believe that the West can win the narrative argument once we learn not to play by our adversaries' rules. Thank you. Thank you, Jed. I, I, I wanted to ask you whether, uh, whether you had given any thought to, I, kn I know you're interested in uh, climate change and whether you'd given any thought to the uh, collective action in the green movement in order to shift social attitudes to uh, climate change and whether there's an opportunity to deploy those same sort of mass participation movements in, in support of uh, democratic values? Uh, unfortunately, I, I used up all of my optimism over there, <laughs> so I'm out. Uh, so I'm, I'm back to being a pessimist now. Uh, while I, I do believe that there is power in, in coming together across national boundaries uh, and becoming part of the green movement and looking to the future of our, of our children, our grandchildren, and our civilization itself, uh, there, there is value there, and it's a, it's, you do need to have a coordinating uh, a, a basis for, for cooperation and coordination. Uh, I think that the threat of climate change is so dire and will have such horrifying knock-on effects from uncontrolled migration to m mass famine uh, that it will lead to more problems uh, indirectly, uh, that people when faced with this uh, giant dark future apocalypse will immediately do what humans always do when faced with dark apocalypses. They will turn on the other and they will turn on each other based on religion, based on gender, based on sexual preference as they always have. Uh, so I'm sorry, but thank, I'm... Thank I, you, that's yeah. pretty dark. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, uh, Matt uh, is going to be looking at uh, Russia's strategic intent. We, we heard this morning from our, our friend from Finland about motive, uh, means, and uh, opportunity in strategic comms, and I, th I think you're going to be looking at uh, strategic intent or motive uh, behind Russia's uh, campaign in Western democracies and what we can do to inoculate ourselves against it and uh, looking at particularly how you create a cost for that. Well, thank activity. you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Dr. Sarts, and thank you, uh, the COE, for this, uh, this event, and I appreciate it. I also understand and appreciate this is a dialogue, and so I'm going to keep my comments brief so we can get into the conversation. Uh, earlier this century, I changed careers from the, the realm of knowledge management, which is about getting the right information to the right person at the right time, which is exactly what we're talking about in this space. And for me to know what information you want, I have to have your questions. So I'm looking forward to uh, that part of the dialogue. So I've got four points I'm going to uh, quickly get through. The first, this is not new. Whereas the first weapon of aggression by the Kremlin is propaganda designed to subvert, to confuse, and to divide the free world and to inflame the Russian and satellite peoples with hatred for, free, for our free institutions, et cetera, et cetera. That was a Senate resolution, U.S. Senate resolution passed in 1951. We've been here before. We figured out what was going on. It was a struggle for minds and wills, not a battle for hearts and minds. We armed ourselves. So the question we have that we forgot from that period of time, the question we have today is, some of this really more about us than about Russia. We frame this in countering Russia, but what are the opportunities that they're taking advantage of? What are, we can call it a weakness, but I prefer to call it, what are we talking about? What do we want tomorrow to look like? What do we want our nations and societies to do and be like, and what are we willing to defend and, and fight for? We heard earlier in some of the conversations the various um, 
let's call it economic and financial vulnerabilities. But what are, where is our political leadership? There's an interesting irony here that th we're talking about the realm of public opinion, yet in democratic nations, how does a leader get elected? By understanding public opinion. And yet in the, this realm of national security, it seems to be forgotten. And so we segregate, we relegate this notion of strategic communication, you can call it by a variety of other names. We relegate it off to the side. In some ways, we outsource it. But this, is a, this, is, this room is filled primarily with people involved uh, on the military side. We, this is a NATO conference. Now, of course, there's going to be some self-selection in that process. But where is our Ministry of Foreign Affairs in these activities? Standing up. But where is the Ministry of Interior? Interior. Where is, for the United States example, the Department of Homeland Security? Where is the Department of Treasury? And I'll tell you, in the 1940s and 1950s, the Department of Treasury was fundamental in this issue. Today, in the United States, we look at Treasury being involved in money flows. But it's about economic development. It's about how do you help and build and inoculate against the adversarial narrative. And that sometimes takes money. Department of Interior, we can look at Fish and Wildlife Services and how they help local societies and local uh, ecological situations. But let me get back to the focus here. Where's our national policies, our inclusion, our communications domestically? There's something I call the marketplace for loyalty. This is not just identity, this is the operation, operation, operationalization, tough one, to get out of identity. We talk about how the boundaries for uh, um, communication, distance, time. We don't talk about how the boundaries of communication of language, ethnicity, culture, religion have fallen. And this is not just the boundaries of communication, but boundaries of group inclusion. Who are you? You can now test drive, opt in to an identity, opt in and test drive multiple identities. And this is both an opportunity and, uh, and a threat. Think of this in a marketing term. Think of this as you're trying to sell a product. You break down the demographics. Now think of it in terms of what is your identity? How many identities do you have? Where are you putting your allegiance? What does this mean to nationalism? What does this mean to national security? And we're not thinking of this in terms of, of that. We're, we're again segregating, segmenting this conversation, this communication aspect, where we have our peoples and we have audiences that we're trying to reach out to that they're opting into other identities and their threshold for action is substantially lower than it ever has been in the past. Whether it is the, the cost for disruption, i.e. a kinetic attack, or promulgating a false narrative. Who are the, who's the allegiance of these people? It's easy to shift allegiance. This, so this gets into the civil society mobilization, it's the whole of government, and how are we bringing this together and how are we understanding that this is a threat to our national security and, and who we are. Third point, to me, is, is a little fascinating and frightening. So I'm old enough to remember when I heard it on the internet was a, a, a derogatory remark. It meant something was fake. Now what's scary is today, I heard it on the internet is a mark of authenticity. It must be true. It's a very frightening element. So, what this seems to have done, we talk about this narratives, but are we actually in a war of words? Now, in the, in the realm of counterinsurgency, we used to say, look, it's not a war of words. There's a say-do gap. We have, to, we have to do. There's the propaganda of the deed and the propaganda of the word, and you know, we need to close that say-do gap. But some of our audiences, are they today such, having such a short attention span and a short interest combined with what we call the death of expertise they are only paying attention to the clickbait. They are only paying attention to the headline. That is what is shaping their opinion, in which case, for some of these audiences, it actually is an interesting fight for the right noun-verb combination. Is it now a war of words for some of our audiences? We, there are no blanket solutions here or statements here. There are some audiences where there is simply no expertise. They are the expert. They have no idea. And how are we addressing those audiences? The f and, and in fact, is there an element that we start to shame people that do that? That they don't understand what they're actually trying to say? I know personally when I see somebody on Facebook share some, some dribble, offline I, kinda, I, I talk to them and I say, do you, do you understand the source here? 
Did you click on the link? Did you look at the actual story? Did you see how it relates to what you're trying to say? And it's quite fascinating because oftentimes they don't. They have no clue. And oftentimes they then delete the post out of shame. But the, the point here is we can talk about narratives, but some of our audiences, it's not about a grand narrative because they're not actually thinking about what is being done, which is a scary thing. We can say something and do something else. And for some audiences, that works because they don't care. They're not paying attention to what you do. My fourth point, and again, I'm, I'm intentionally keeping this super brief because I want to get in the conversation. I'm hoping I'm provoking some ideas and questions uh, from you. But what is our relationship with Russia? What do we want our relationship with Russia? Since the, the primary focus of the conversation here is Russia, I'm going to pick on them. What do we want our relationship to be? What are we willing to fight for and defend? What cost are we willing to impose on Russia for the activities that they are conducting in our nations? Are we willing to, to surrender some of the financial and economic elements because we want to be enriched by the relationship? Of course, they have very little to contribute on the international scale, but there is money that can flow into our nations from them. This gets into the political will question and the political leadership question once again. What are we willing to do? I haven't seen any activity right now with regard to the, the topic of conversation here that is deterrent to Russia. There is simply no cost that we are imposing upon them, and I see nothing going in that direction. I see us talking about countering, which, as, as Judd aptly pointed out, is allowing them to set the field of engagement, the rules of engagement, as well as the field. That's not accurate. We need to get ahead of this. And that draws me into my conclusion, and that is, are we preparing to fight the last war? as we're talking about ru what Russia is doing today and not looking ahead in advance, we already know that fighting the last war is a, is a great tendency of the military. But how are we looking ahead to preempt, to advance, to inoculate, and to set the terms of engagement on our terms? We're democracies. We believe in the freedom of speech. We believe in a whole bunch of freedoms, the freedom to listen. But those are easily abused. How far are we allowing somebody else who doesn't believe in those, who wants, who, who wants destabilization, how well are, are we going to fight for this? And how are we going to bring in the rest of the government and society? Personally, I, I've been frustrated because I'm at these conferences, this is, uh, uh, you know, innumerable conferences, and we keep talking about tactics. And the tactics are generally looking at how do we counter the other guy's tactic. We need to get ahead of the ball and figure out what do we want and what are we willing to defend and fight for. And then we set the, uh, set the terms of engagement. So again, I appreciate your, uh, I look forward to the questions. I appreciate the time. Thank you.